Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you're joining us from. We're very excited to have you all here today for an in-depth panel discussion on the future of retail and, and, um, and how the impact of AI is driving changes in the retail industry, whether it's on safety and security, operational efficiency, or even improving the customer experience. I'm very excited to be partnering with our leader or industry leaders at BCD, NVIDIA, and ProHawk AI to bring you insights on the future of AI in retail, its impact on perimeter security, and innovative ways to unlock the potential of smart spaces. I'm going to go ahead and let each of our panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll go ahead and get started, starting with Dan O'Mahony from BCD. Thank you, Kellyanne. So Dan O'Mahony at BCD, I'm our uh, Vice President of OEM and Strategic Initiatives, and uh, beyond excited to be here with Dan and Brent today to to cover the future of retail. So uh, again, Kellyanne, thank you. Awesome. Brent, you want to go next? Yeah, I share uh, Dan's enthusiasm and excitement and follow his uh, follow his lead as I usually do. Um, I spent a lot of years in retail and consumer goods before uh, joining ProHawk as their COO. So I'm excited in partnership with BCD and NVIDIA because ProHawk can't do stuff on their own. NVIDIA can't do stuff on their own and neither can BCD, but in combination, boy, we can make a real difference for retail productivity today. Awesome, thank you. And Dan Connors. Thank you. Yes, I'm also excited to be here. Um, I'm Dan Connors. I've been working for NVIDIA for the past four years as a developer advocate for uh, AI solutions, specifically in the retail and smart city space. And before then, I was working as a professor at uh, University of Colorado, uh, building out um, analytic solutions that um, use GPU computing. And so there's always been a natural fit between what is coming with greater computing power and what that enables within different industries. So looking forward to talking about that today. Awesome. Thank you. And to all of our attendees, just so you're all aware, there is a Q&A feature. So at any point throughout the session, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them in there and we will address them towards the end. With that, we will go ahead and get started. Question number one, how would you describe the role of AI in advancing smart retail spaces? Dan Connors, let's start with you. Well, thank you for giving me the chance to start and, um, you know, AI, changes all spaces and we have to look towards uh, each domain differently, but it's it's fundamentally transforming the way that retail operates, both in the store, in the physical space, and then online uh, on your phone. Uh, it really enhances the, the customer experience. So if we have this, you know, this is the diagram that we kind of use to chart all the different potential ways that within a retail uh, smart space, uh, AI can transform. So each one of these can be affected. And, th and this really just even shows just the opening of the, the store. There's back of house, front of house, parking lot. All of them uh, coordinate together and then all of them coordinate to how AI also uh, can get involved with logistics and supply chain. So, so these things work together and, and that's what we really think gets uh, uh, more connected as we go further and further in time. But if we, if we just isolate a few of these elements that are in this picture, you know, AI powered computer vision specifically could uh, help automate self-checkout. And uh, I'm sure people are, are experiencing that now, whether it's a full autonomous store or a frictionless uh, checkout environment, um, they're being used for loss prevention at the self-checkout. You've probably interacted with those systems and, and, also within like stadium environments where there might be retail for concessions. Uh, a lot of the latest stadiums being built have now also been uh, enabled from the from the design perspective with AI in mind to say like, how do we keep people in their seats? So we want their uh, ability to get up, get something to eat, drink, uh, purchased and back. And so, so a lot of it we see really being these autonomous checkout experiences first, but there's other ones within this picture that that show as far as doing inventory um, detection, meaning when things are out of stock, that when you actually need workers uh, to come out and actually restock some shelves. And so there's there's any number of these from 
uh, even customer engagement. So as you're shopping, you might have a smart cart, you might have a, a smart interactive uh, screen in front of you that then is giving you suggestions or allowing you to um, have have recommended uh, products for your space. And so we see it from both a, a great customer perspective, being the store customer, and then from the retail perspective, there's a lot to really adapt AI solutions in. Um, and so each each week we we find new uh, enterprises trying to do things with AI technology. So thank yeah, you. I, I was just going to interject, Kellyanne, that look, I think Dan's <clears throat> exactly right. AI and generative AI is going to be pervasive, both in the back office of how retailers operate on the private label, on production, on logistics, supply chain, you name it. And then the front consumer facing pieces uh, like self checkouts and especially with the issues on labor. And maybe it's even more pronounced in Europe. I see Europe doing so much more frictionless checkout and self-checkout and less labor, more automated things. But even though those AI applications are going to be pervasive in the future, you know, I ask, what can we do now to improve those retail margins, right? Because those retail margins are so much thinner than a lot of the consumer goods manufacturers. They're 20% and under, and the consumer goods manufacturers you know, are 40% and over at the gross margin level. And one way that we can help now, pragmatically tomorrow, is in reducing theft and reducing loss, right? So it's a big number, 112 billion lost, and that is up 20.5% percent versus prior year and a lot of these states were aren't even prosecuting this unless it reaches a minimum threshold for, before they even get charged with a, a misdemeanor and i knew a, a, a new rule just went in in florida so saving money by reducing theft uh, wherever it is in the store is one way that ai or computer vision ai can make a difference today um, and if you look at where a lot of that theft happens, it's at that self-checkout. And the unconscionable thing to me is that 15% of consumers admit to stealing at the self-checkouts. And what's even more unconscionable is 44% say, hmm, I got away with it, so I'm going to do it again. I mean, where is the karma in this world? Um, but it is four times greater than, you know, other forms of stealing. So it is a big issue. And anytime computer vision can see or precise or you get recorded there or you can see more uh, uh, um, uh, critical details at that critical point in time, uh, it will create a, a, a more of a deterrent. And it's not just there, it's uh, other areas. Think about reducing costs from an insurance standpoint, right? Slip and falls is another big issue that these retailers are facing. And um, I, I was surprised to show that Walmart settles out most of these things and their minimum settlement is like $100,000 and some of them are a million bucks and more. And it correlates to $70 billion in just the medical costs. I'm not talking about the payouts uh, uh, on these 8.5 million cases a year. It's $70 billion in medical cost, cost payments. So here's another issue where computer vision can get precision there. And then if I go to outside the perimeter, a basic right a lot of these customers think about on that perimeter hmm let me do more lighting let me uh do more outside protection i think if you go to the next chart kelly and you might be able to see it um and these those insurance uh, costs are skyrocketing but instead of just thinking through let me do more lighting boy, there's new solutions, a combination of BCD, NVIDIA, and ourselves can, instead of saying, replace those cameras that even if it's a 4K or 8K camera, it's still not seen at night, it's still not seen through rain, it's still not seen through those obstacles, but using software like ProHawk underpinned by NVIDIA and, uh, and BCD can see the insight at critical point in time to enable reduction of those insurance costs and better protection of their consumers in the parking lots. And just to, to chime in, although going after Dan and Brent is always tough, um, 
What's really interesting to me is you you hear from Dan and you hear about the long term value add incremental gains that you can get. And then you hear Brent saying, here's the immediate opportunity. So not only is the long term opportunity huge, but there's opportunity that you can register today. And one thing that I always when I when I think of AI, when I hear people talking about developing of these LLMs, et cetera, is to do that, you need to ingest, host, and then read through millions, billions of data points. And that's what we're talking about here is leveraging data points to ensure uh, better safety, to minimize risk towards whether it's insurance, uh, claims against your retail space, theft. And one thing that's important is, yes, the tools are there, Brent already mentioned it about the bundle with ProHawk is there are opportunities that you could leverage today to register incremental gains as an end user within the retail space. But as you leverage more and more data, one thing that needs to underpin your strategy is how you are protecting that data uh, from bad actors, from people going in there. So when you're looking at your systems you have today or systems in the future, making sure that they're hardened so you get the full benefit of the value and people don't come in, take that, whether it's swiping credit cards or things like that. Um, so I just wanted to, to marry those two points together around as you leverage more data, and that's where everything is headed towards, having that mentality of protecting that as well, I think is paramount to register the success of these opportunities that both Dan and Brent mentioned. Absolutely, thank you for that. And Brent, in your last uh, response, you touched a little bit on perimeter security. So diving a little bit deeper into that, what are the challenges in perimeter security today and how will visual restoration impact the way that shopping centers are evolving? Well, one is those rising insurance costs, I think. But the other one is if you look at this is a lot of those technologies are just cameras are just not working. And what you see here is actually ProHawk. It's the exact same video on the left that you see on the right. And what's unique about ProHawk, again, you have to have the NVIDIA chip to get this real-time benefit, is you're actually transforming this video on the left 33 million times every three milliseconds because of the NVIDIA chips to be able to get this uh, uh, visual insight. And if you're looking at a safety and security situation or you're looking at you know, sun glare or you're looking at any one of those environmental obstacles, the critical insight at the critical moment in time is critical to be able to save lives and protect your customers. You know, here we're just um, taking out every single snowflake because we can do it pixel by pixel. Again, 33 million times every three milliseconds. Uh, and you just, these new tools are just, from a total cost of ownership from a retail standpoint, even though you ostensibly have capital to spend, these new software tools, total cost of ownership is so much lower then new lighting, new hardware, new sort of traditional mindsets to solving the problem. We can solve it with technology today to have a better, safer environment for uh, for our customers in the retail environment. And if it's okay, Kellyanne, I wanna build on a point that uh, Brent was just alluding to of how, how would you attack this today? More lighting, new cameras, et cetera, that's a huge capital expenditure for an end user, and they may have an immediate need, but they don't have the funds today to get that. So the one thing that I want to highlight, and it's, it was showcased perfectly in the video as, as Brent was voicing over it, but you can switch your mindset of how you look at these solutions, these potential opportunities for your retail customers. And there's an opportunity to actually leverage existing infrastructure that solves your needs today. So instead of waiting and, and dealing with whether it's supply chain constraints and log lead times to have someone come in, uh, install new lighting or bring in new cameras that get the business goal that you have today. There's an opportunity in those brownfield systems where you can layer on a product like ProHawk. Uh, there's a whole host of other AI that you can layer on top, whether it's maybe not on the perimeter, but inside, and it actually leverages resources of your existing infrastructure today to get the benefits that we're seeing uh, as as the video kind of highlighted of, okay, I don't need to get a bunch of new cameras and I don't need to install new lighting and wait weeks, months, which going back to 
the, the slides earlier around the cost, the opportunity cost of waiting is diminished when layering in a software like ProHawk where you can leverage your existing infrastructure today and get the benefits that you want much sooner. Awesome. And on your last section, you spoke a little bit about um, building on current installs. What would you say are the opportunities for a greenfield project or a brand new expansion? Yeah, I think at that point, um, one, that's probably the ideal state for everyone uh, where you can go in and, and capture what the, the constraints are today and provide a solution to address that uh, in the near term. But what we would encourage you to do is don't look out what we want to accomplish in a month and a quarter and a year. There are solutions here today, like we were just talking about, where in a green field, it's switching the mindset of this addresses a concern or a need that we have for our perimeter within our parking lots, as an example. And it can say, OK, how can we leverage that within our existing or within the store that we're going to build out? And what other business goals do we have? that we can design a system, design a full scale solution that we know we're going to get the benefit from visual restoration. We know we're not going to need new lighting, but how else can we leverage these types of technology to streamline how we operate as a business today? Thank you. Anything else before we move on to the next question? I, I would just add to that and in, in the earlier point about what AI is enabling in those, you know, the main challenge in that perimeter, especially for shopping centers or shopping uh, zones, is really in ensuring like a comprehensive coverage and so and real time responsiveness. Um, and so both of those, when if you're talking about greenfield or connecting AI to existing, is what uh, can now be uh, scoped out so that you're not just saying, well, we have this specific solution. It's covering 10% of our our area. Um, now we're talking about tracking between cameras uh, so that you get a full picture about what's going on in the spaces. And Kellyanne, if I can just add one more point, marrying what uh, Dan and Brent were both talking about is the benefit is how fast technology is evolving how fast customer needs are evolving, um, knowing that there's huge opportunity today to tap into and recognize that uh, within the retail space. The, the great thing about this partnership with ProHawk with NVIDIA BCD is we know that new technology will be out there, whether it's in six months or six years. So adopting that mentality when going into the project and leveraging the scalability that we have allows for you to then say, in a year, well, we now have this new need and we revert back to what we were talking about earlier. There's opportunity to leverage that infrastructure and get incremental gain as time progresses. Thank you all. Moving on to our next question. In your experience, what advancements in video hardware are enhancer the, enhancing the user experience today? Dan Connors, let's start with you. Sure, and you know, while there, there are video and, and hardware um, enhan enhan enhancements, um, and they're important. Really, the game changer is increasing the computing power. So over both a hardware and software stack. So you know we refer to NVIDIA's solution as a accelerated computing platform, not just a, a NVIDIA GPU. And so while you can expect between the different generations of, of hardware, so if I go back, you know, between a um, Turing generation and then an Ampere and, and um, Ada Lovelace, if we track different GPU models and those from NVIDIA, we do see a, an extended 2x performance. And that's different from uh, previous decades where Moore's Law was providing 2x in the number of transistors. We're, we're seeing it actually in performance. But that that is sustained uh, and tracked out. What really is then the advancement to all of these enablements is there is a, a really rich software ecosystem then built on top of the hardware. So NVIDIA alone has 300 different uh, AI computing libraries and platforms that get adjusted uh, throughout the year, and they're all to enable that hardware piece. And so if you look at all, what that collection might mean from, especially from a camera perspective, from when the camera image comes in, 
um, to the output result for an application, there's this massive uh, pipeline of improvements that can steadily gain new uh, new ad video analytics um, events into your your business stream and operation streams. Hey, Kellyanne, I just want to chime in, um, and I want to be a little bit more direct on one thing than uh, the Dan C was. I, I think it's the wrong question because <laughs> um, it, it's not about the hardware that is going to transform things. It is the compute power that Dan C mentioned, and it's the software. And if I go back to Dan O's comment, things are going to change, whether it's in six months or six years. And guess what? How much cheaper is it to do a software update of, of that um, versus changing out all new hardware again in six months or six years? From a total cost of ownership standpoint, this is a way to get started now, to Dan's point, on the AI applications that make a difference on fairly thin retail margins today as a conduit to all of the other things that AI and, and companies like NVIDIA and BCD can do with AI to pervade all aspects of retail in the future. But it's a way to get started today. And it's also not just a conduit to the other strategic, strategic applications, it's a conduit to longer term, lower total cost of ownership. And to, to build on that point, Brent, I think of that typical adoption curve, right? So you think of maybe in a certain sector, it took 10 years to have consumer adoption. And then you have Netflix comes out and it's three years to adoption. Then you have, you know, Instagram comes out and it's a year and a half. And now you have OpenAI and the day that they launch, right? How many millions of users they have signed up? So to Brent's point of we don't know what that new software layer could be, the time to adopt to it is getting lower and lower and lower. So having a, a solution that's scalable, that's ready to handle the throughputs that we have today, but also no leveraging the backend work and the development that NVIDIA is doing on their chipsets and how they're approaching the market, you have the comfort in knowing you can be kind of on the, the bleeding edge of that adoption curve so that you're not caught out and then going down the path with Brent said of, oh, wow, we may have to replace everything that we installed eight months ago because there's this new game-changing technology that wasn't in existence six months ago. This gives you that flexibility, scalability, and leverages that total cost of ownership that Brent was mentioning. Fantastic. Thank you all. And speaking of up-and-coming developments, we'll end our, t our session today on the topic of what trends and predictions do you have for the future of AI-enabled visual restoration in retail environments? Dan Connors, let's start with you. Sure, you know, I can speak more to overall AI uh, re in retail, you know, and in the future, these will definitely evolve towards a multimodal experience, uh, you know, for the, uh, especially for the observation analytics patterns, not talking about the customer experience. So multimodal is going to mean combining video analytics and language models that we are just starting to in the last two years interact with and we're going to, you know, with this, there's even more sensory data that create these adaptive environments from the management perspective. You know, one key trend in AI is to analyze video feeds, but now you, you have that capability coming online for both live and recorded um, access to networks of cameras. And this is really going to enhance the understanding of what's taking place in these uh, store environments, as well as uh, you know, smart city and spaces anywhere that you have cameras, and so that the integration of large language models will create more interaction with the AI systems themselves and get retail environments more insight um, based upon this visual data. So I th I think they're going to play a much more critical role and um, being able to customize what interactions you have with the AI uh, enabled spaces. Kelly, and I want to interject with just two points. Um, number one, I always like to survive in the short term to be able to thrive in the long term. And surviving in the short term is putting more food on the table. 
driving more profitability today, uh, miti mitigating costs, mitigating uh, theft, mitigating loss, reducing insurance costs on perimeter protection. So those are some AI computer vision things that can be done uh, today. So that's kind of uh, kind of point one. And and it, it, the the AI applications that Dan C and Dan O mentioned are going to be pervasive, um, but there are things that we can do immediately and immediately today to um, uh, make both the inside uh, a more productive place and the outside a safer place. So, you know, uh, I, I think these applications will be uh, uh, pervasive again in, in all aspects of retail, but there are things that can be done today, especially on the safety and security and, uh, and loss prevention side. Yeah. And Brent, you used it twice. And the second time you, you emphasized it of it being pervasive. And I think that's an astute kind of forward looking way of, of what's going to happen to retail. And to me, what that highlights is, and you were alluding to it of inside and outside boosting profitability, uh, it's going to have an impact on the entire value chain of, of a retail location. So a lot of the, the conversation thus far, we're talking about one physical store or maybe uh, a mall or something like that. And as you think about the applications that are to come and are already available in the market today is this bleeds into opportunity beyond the physical portion and moves into supply chain operations, data operations. And what it's going to allow is a streamline of the production of your product to the end consumer. And incrementally along the way, you can leverage these technologies to boost your profitability. So uh, I love calling it pervasive because it's going to eat away at what are traditionally high cost things to operate, streamline that, which then will lead to a better end user uh, experience, right? Because they're getting the things that they want faster. Uh, they may be getting price breaks on what that product is because the opportunity to whittle down and really streamline your operations and looking at the whole value chain, it's going to just be all, it's going to be implemented across that value chain and lead to a better end customer experience. Fantastic. Thank you all for that. Um, just to dive a little bit deeper into some of these, we talk a lot about the proactive ways that retailers can start utilizing AI to start benefiting their business. But looking back at that video that Brent had shown earlier, um, I'm curious to know what are some of the situations that led them to realize that a visual restoration solution was the right fit? Coming back to this one here. Uh, well, I, I think some of the customers are saying, um, hmm, even with, I mean, they're, they're getting it, even with better cameras, even with uh, perfect conditions, uh, uh, and, and even with more expensive hardware, I'm still ending up with that same solution. And it's interesting, I was talking to the head of AI for the US Army, and if we think about that, your, the future of, of AI in retail, he said, look, all of the AI analytics and applications and gen AI things in the future are driven off of quality data. What ProHawk does, underpinned again by NVIDIA and an by BCD, is it just takes that degraded data or degraded visual data and makes it actionable, makes it real, makes it improved such that all those video analytics and all of those other AI applications can work better in the future. So I just go back to things that we can do now on safety, security, reducing theft lower total cost of ownership and a conduit to enable gen AI things to work in the future is is that combination of of of, of for me what all makes sense for for our, for our key customers today and from from my standpoint again looking at the video referencing what Brent has mentioned so far is to me what makes it that wow factor or beyond impactful 
is I highlight what we were talking about, and it was either the first or second question is this is readily available today. So to Brent's point, you can recognize the value of this today, but the cost, the uplift to implement this type of solution, it can lay on top of existing infrastructure today. So really you can get this benefit quickly. And to me, I know you asked the question of what were some of the situations that led them to this to the solution. I think the ability to recognize and capture the value of it almost instantaneously was probably a huge driving factor in the adoption of the solution, as, as opposed to saying, okay, Brent, this looks amazing, but we don't have the CapEx spend to, to implement this entire solution. It, it removes that headache, if you will. Well, and on top of that, one of my big headaches when I hear a lot about these software companies I haven't heard of is, well, they sound good, but then it's six months of software engineering and resources and money to implement and integrate. You know, the reason that, um, you know, ProHawk partnered with BCD and is one of NVIDIA's, you know, select few global preferred partners is because this is no code. We built those industry standard interfaces, so it is really plug and play uh, and implementable in hours. So it's not six months to be able to get a solution like Dan talked about. It's something that we can do tomorrow in brownfield things. Uh, and if we wanted to in the future for for bigger greenfield, uh, you know, more clean slate exercises. So it's ready and implementable now to make a difference. Fantastic. Thank you both for that. At this point, I'd love to open it up to our audience for any questions that you may have, and then we can dive into a little bit of a deeper discussion. Stop sharing and check here. One question I'd like to start with is, with the increasing importance of data privacy, how do AI-driven solutions uh, ensure compliance with regulations that are still being effective in the industry? I think Dan C, I'm going to volunteer Dan C to answer that on behalf of the group. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do see, so So, in trying to address that first, let me say I, I do see that as a, a major concern uh, that comes up and that uh, software vendors have to be able to answer. And uh, it is very, uh, there's an array of compliances. You know, if we just even look the differences between Europe and the United States, and then within the United States, you you almost uh, have to go per state. Uh, there are different uh, legislations that govern over those different areas. So you, you really have to have an awareness and where the data is going to um be accessible and what's going to happen in terms of its movement. Uh, and that is one of the big hurdles that I would say for any software developer that has a solution that can address that immediately, meaning that they have practice in it, uh, that is going to change the, the des development deployment time uh, by a massive, a substantial amount because there there is a readiness to uh, find solutions out there that can address this. And so um, hopefully I answered part of, you know, at least part of that where it, it is critical to it. As far as, you know, I, I would deem it as this very often, what you would summarize of what the request is, is they want a cameraless camera system, you know, meaning that something that can both identify what's happening, but without identifying, uh, actual people. And you can think of a number of environments for, for where that would be. Uh, a great solution and but it's it's there's a paradox with asking for that from the beginning but it's it's definitely getting addressed more and more and to to piggyback on one note that dan mentioned which i think is usually top of mind uh was around where that data is then stored um so ensuring that uh the systems that it resides on how it flows through uh, it has a cyber hardened approach to it because uh, the last thing you want right is to be collecting all this information and have a system that's easily penetrable right and someone can come in and take that data etc so uh, leading with that and understanding that if you approach that opportunity problem with a hardened approach a lot of that is along the way you're setting in the right measures to combat 
the potential of a data loss or not protecting that data. Thank you. Anything else on this one before we move on? We've got one more question in the chat. All right, and then our question is, what are we all working on regarding digital twinning? Sorry, maybe you can repeat the question just to... Uh... Yes, the question is, what are you guys working on regarding digital twinning? I can again talk from the NVIDIA, you know, again, my my role, I see this a lot as a developer advocate um, where you're, you're interacting with spaces, meaning it could be manufacturing, could be distribution centers. You know, I, I work a lot in the retail space, but also then smart city space. And there is a uh, goal to build the digital twin, like a digital asset uh, framework in mind. And so, you know, NVIDIA has both from the um, perspective of like graphics, the omniverse simulator that you can build a replication framework. So we have these tools in mind that um, give you the advantage of being able to, to see or plan out spaces. So a lot of what we see in retail is somebody wanting to say, and they have very varied environments. You might have 500 different stores and they all have different, while, while we think of them as box stores and might have a commonality, um, a lot of them have different checkout lanes and positions, and each one is trying to uh, find which way they should design their checkout solutions next to their um, their their shelves. And so they're they're turning to these solutions to be able to um, be able to come up with what is the most optimal layout for different stores. And so it's definitely something to that then interacts with computer vision solutions, because what we find is once you've built a digital twin, what we've put together at NVIDIA is also to be able to put in simulated cameras into those spaces and then run early model development uh, from the perspective of testing out accuracy versus having to go live in a pilot store you're going to be able, and you see this with autonomous driving. You know, we like as far as how many autonomous vehicles you might see on the road. There is millions of times worth of hours that are happening in the digital space of of practicing those those driverless cars, and so it's it's coming about that as those get more mature, we see it also in this digital twin space as well. So I, I talked a little bit about a broad use of the technology again, but maybe there's there's instances of specific retail requests for them. And to to maybe dive into what the specific uh, some specifics could be is, you know, it, it's probably an entire whole nother talk show to speak directly to that. But from a high level, um, there are technologies out there that uh, I would almost Maybe the, the framing is incorrect, but asset tagging images. Uh, so what that means is when an image is captured, the location of that is, is captured, all the data is captured, and then it replicates that and stores it so that you can go back and see if it's been tampered with. Uh, and where that could come into play, bringing it back to, to Brent's point, is around liabilities, people falling in stores. You can see and have essentially a, a watermark, if you will, that explains was this video tampered with or not. So as people, you know, can find creative ways to game the system or find ways to leverage technology today to enhance their own uh, whatever their own desires are, there are technologies out there that can show the cut the chain of custody of that video of that that data where it was captured when it was captured and then if it was changed at all. So. That's a proactive measure in, in addressing the digital twin or seeing if something was tampered with uh, when being reviewed. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Well, if there are no other questions, we will go ahead and wrap up for today. I want to thank you all again for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, for everybody attending, we will be following up with the recording of the webinar if you're interested in viewing it again. Um, and we will also provide contact information if you're interested in learning more. So be on the lookout for that in the next day or so. Um, and other than that, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all so much.